coming to get settled in, but um, I'm going to start. So, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Chrissy Ziccarelli, and I realize that the title of my talk was a bit of a misnomer. Uh, philosophy to pedagogy sounds really heady, like we're going to be talking about Aristotle and Kant, uh, but I should dissuade you now. We're going to spend a lot more time talking about early aughts uh, emo pop punk. Uh, instead of any of the people that I like to learn about, mainly through The Good Place on NBC. Um, so what I really want to share today is a story of how I first started interacting with my computer and controlling the output that I was seeing, uh, mainly through the blogging platform LiveJournal. <laughs> Uh, but first, a little bit about me. I'm a professional educator. I work full-time as the Director of Education at Girls Who Code, so spend a lot of time thinking about how to increase access to computer science and particularly get more women and girls involved in CS. Um, I'm a hobbyist programmer. My recent uh, passion has been creating really ugly websites that look like they are part of GeoCities uh, from the late 90s time period that we're talking about. I'm a lifelong journaler, mainly on paper. I have composition books dating all the way back to when I was in third grade, and I still keep a journal today. And I'm a potentially former blog hacker, but technically I realize my live journal is still live, so there's always a chance to get back into it. Uh, and that's my old MySpace profile picture. I really did a deep dive on my old uh, teenage high school profiles for this talk. <laughs> So I talk about my coding journey a lot uh, in the course of my work and learning about how other people got interested in computer science and technology. And one thing that I always mention is that LiveJournal was the first place where I ever wrote a line of code. Uh, at the time, I didn't recognize that it was code or know that it was computer science, but nonetheless, that was absolutely the first time I ever, as I said, interacted with my computer in a way that was more than just clicking on a WYSIWYG or pre-made button. And when I started sharing this story, I noticed that more and more, so many people would tell me that that was also the first place that they saw any type of computer programming or code. And I started to notice that of this group that would always come up and share that to me, that a lot of the people that were telling me that were women. So as someone who spends most of my day thinking about how to create that initial spark and interest in computer science and new programmers, I really started to wonder, what is it about these online blogging community platforms that inspired so many of us to explore and teach ourselves? Uh, as an educator, that's what I always really want to build, is lifelong learners and people that are going to go beyond what's happening in the classroom or in the program so that they find out new things for themselves and start to build it into part of their identity. In so many of the places um, that we built these online communities 15 years ago, we're really, really strong at doing that, even when there were way fewer resources, uh, in-person communities, programs, classes, movements behind computer science education. So what did they do well, and what can we do to mimic the type of environment that they created and bring that into our in-person interactions and the online communities that we're a part of today. Uh, but first, I know that we have a vast representation of people here. You were not all 16 years old in 2004 like I was. Um, so I'm going to date myself in this, but I wanted to bring everyone into an understanding of what the internet was like back when I was in middle and high school. And I couldn't find, when I was looking on the internet, I was trying to find either a visual representation or a video, but really the best thing that encompassed it was this tweet. Uh, it said, you know, people my age are complaining about how kids today don't go outside, they run right home and go into Minecraft, as if we did not spend hours crafting passive-aggressive messages for all of our friends and frenemies on our AIM profiles. Um, I tried to find my old one, absolutely couldn't, but when I did an image search of a AOL Instant Messenger profiles, the same Taking Back Sunday quote showed up in three of the top ten image results. So I think we were all kind of going through something together at that time. <laughs> um, so this is kind of the lay of the land in the internet as I cared about it back in the early aughts. LiveJournal, as I mentioned, was my bread and butter. 
Uh, for anyone that wasn't familiar, it's a blogging platform, but when you created your profile, you not only had your individual blog, but you were able to join other community blogs, which were really like message boards, where you could create more robust posts and comment and have discussions with other people based on the interest or the theme of the, the community that you were a part of. Um, I was definitely on AIM all the time. MySpace, I had a Zango, which no one knew about, and that was more of like my place where I could explore and write things that I knew no one was going to see. Uh, but my favorite on this list is something that comes up again and again is Neopets, because you were able to customize your, your Neopets and your profile in a way that a lot of other sites uh, that were built around products or toys wouldn't allow you to. So these are the ones that I hear the most frequently, um, but I think you can think of your own sort of corollary of wherever you had some fun space to like play around on the internet. Uh, so I thought that the best way to examine why LiveJournal meant so much to me and to so many of us was to take a real live example from my blog back in 2006. So just wanted to give everyone a warning uh, that that's what we are going to see. Um, I am living one of the values that I think is really key to this entire online community experience and being vulnerable. So uh, let's take a look at what I was thinking about all those years ago. So this is a screenshot from my old blog. Uh, as you can see, my, user, or my username was Chris Z. The title of my blog was a quote from Can't Heat by Jamiroquai, which is also the last number in the center stage, my favorite movie at the time. I was also very obsessed with The Office. Uh, that has not died down very much, but I would probably not this, make this picture of Jimmy Pam my profile picture. Um, and I was really emotional over a song. I was punched in the gut by this song that I linked out to. And I have been in love with it for many, many years, but I feel like I finally went through the heartbreak that got me to understand it. And if anyone is curious, it's a Blink-182 song. <laughs> uh, specifically, it was Apple Shampoo. <laughs> Uh, which I'm still a Dude Ranch fan, so hopefully there are people out there that love it too. Um, but so there's a lot going on in terms of emotion, design, the, the quotes that I decided to include, and photos, but there's also a lot going on from a programming perspective here. So there are some things like the title of the blog, my profile picture that I put in using a WYSIWYG editor, you know, where there was a field, you could upload something, you could type in text, save it, and it shows up. But there were a lot of things that I had to go into the text editor to change. So making the, the user info and calendar all lowercase, that was um, something that I controlled with CSS. The formatting of the date was something that I remember adjusting manually um, through a WYSIWYG. The uh, comment link down on the bottom, written in lead speak, uh, where you could say something about my post if it really moved you as well uh, was something that I remember coding as um, in addition to all that stuff. But I think the biggest one that I really want to talk about is this cup tag right here. So what happened is when you clicked on the words I have, it expanded the content in the blog post um, to something that was initially hidden and then you could click and collapse it. This was my favorite trick on LiveJournal and it was the first HTML tag that I ever committed to memory. Um, and I remember it really, really fondly for doing that. And when you look back through a lot of my old entries, I saw that I did this a lot of times. Um, but I really wanted to, to explain how that worked. Obviously, there's, there's an opening cut tag in HTML, and then you put the content that you want to hide, and then you include the text that should show up linked, and then you put the closing tag. Um, it felt like a lot for me to remember, but I was really excited the first time I ever did it right on the first try without having to Google or look it up, because Google took a lot longer in 2006. Um, but I mentioned a little bit about my coding journey earlier and how the story I tell always really centers around LiveJournal. Um, and really, that's the inception point, but there are so many points after that. Um, that really come back to the experience of committing this tag to memory and how much that meant for me moving forward. So 
the next sort of piece of my journey was when I went to college. And I'll always remember in my freshman engineering seminar, we were learning MATLAB, and I was struggling so hard. Um, I didn't have a proper introduction to what programming is and to how to interact with your computer. Um, MATLAB, sorry, is a programming language that's really good at physics, so engineers use it a lot. Um, and I was really, really struggling through this course and trying to make it through with office hours and TA help and friends, but like nothing really seemed to make it easier until one day in like the depths of the evening in the computer lab, I realized that the same way I had to have an opening and a closing tag to get that content to squish, and if I forgot the closing tag, it would just swallow up the whole rest of the post, that those matching commands were the same thing that were going to impact my MATLAB code, um, where I had to have you know, matching brackets and all of the other things that come along with writing in a programming language. And from that moment on, that was when I kind of like came online and realized what was happening and sort of cruised through the rest of the semester and felt really excited doing all of the problem sets um, and did really well on the exams. I did not finish college as an engineer, but I think that that's largely due to I still couldn't identify that both my live journal experience and that first uh, excitement I felt around MATLAB were both part of the same discipline. So I think naming that both of those were computer science and computer programming would have led me on a very different path that didn't take me, you know, quite as circumstantial or circumventing a, a path to get to where I am today. But as you trace that sort of meandering path to Girls Who Code and the work that I do and the projects that I build, I think at every single point along the way, there's that same moment of recognition and excitement that I felt the first time that I was able to write this blog post and do it on my own without having to look it up. So now I want to talk a little bit about why so many people felt like me, that these were really great spaces to explore, uh, to extend yourself, and to really apply some personality and knowledge. Uh, I think they did three things really, really well. One was encouraging vulnerability, embedding personalization, and essentializing community. So we'll start by talking about vulnerability. These were platforms that were all about feelings and putting yourself out there. So inherent in signing up for it, the folks that were interested were saying like, I wanna share something about myself with the rest of the world. So they were already in that mindset of sharing and putting themselves out there in a way that they, you know, there is a little bit of risk associated, but the reward that they felt was, was going to be there. I think another thing that's really important to think about is the user-controlled privacy settings on LiveJournal. At least this was very important to me, and I think really important to think about uh, when we're trying to bring in new people into our communities, whether they be younger students or even our peers. Uh, but if you look back up in the very top left corner of the actual content, there's that I. Um, and there was different privacy settings on every single live journal post you had. You could either control your whole blog the same way that you do with your Instagram or your, or your Twitter feed, um, but you could also make public posts, target them to specific individuals, or make them completely private just for yourself. Um, so I think that teaching people that are new to these communities that they'll always have an option to pull back a little bit or keep something to their self, themselves is really important. So talking about personalization, obviously blogs are all about imbuing uh, your own personality and who you are and sharing that with other people. Uh, so providing lots of customizable options with different levels of interaction. I mentioned that there were WYSIWYGs or easy fields where you could update your profile or personalize things for yourself. But then, you know, what I have found is most of the people that I talked to that got really, really into to coding their themes and messing around with their blogs was when they were really passionate about something that was very, very specific. Uh, the color choices that were available weren't quite right. They really wanted everything, like I always did, to be all lowercase. Uh, to go in, into the option to actually hard code things and to get a little bit more specific. So providing those different levels of customization can help people teach themselves and gradually uh, increase their, their fluency and involvement with the creation process. 
Um, and finally, there's a lots of blank space for expression in all of these platforms. Um, that is really the central piece of everything uh, that is happening on blogging communities. Uh, you log in and you really just have a lot of room to explore and express yourself. Um, so leaving that open is one thing that drew a lot of people to these communities. And then finally, essentializing the community part of all of this. Uh, so having lots of space for comments and conversation, uh, not only within each individual's post, but I remember spending most of my time in groups together um, that were sort of self-moderated and everyone could con contribute um, in an equitable way. Um, I think that part of the reason I spent so much time in those communities is there was a lot of space for shared interests. Um, that there's a lot of affinity that you can find with other people. This was still the early days of like meeting strangers who were into the same thing as you um, on the internet. So I think that that was really special. Um, and when you got to share that much of your identity, um, that is what made people feel like they had a space where they could be supported, um, regardless of what they were trying or figuring out. So I want to talk about how we can bring this into not only our classrooms, but our meetups, our friendships, and our larger uh, communities, since that's what we're really all thinking about today. Um, so when you are working with a group of new programmers, existing programmers, I think encouraging vulnerability and setting up the norms for that in a space is really, really important. Um, one thing I always like to do with folks that are newer is have them run buggy code on purpose. Um, we, as I said, in my day job, I work with w women and young girls a lot. And one of the, the stories that has always stuck with me from one of our teachers is that they walked up to someone who was having trouble with the project with a completely blank screen. But once she clicked Control Z or Undo once or twice, she saw that that student had actually had a screen full of code, but deleted it because she was so afraid to show an error, she would rather show no work and nothing at all. So what I always like to do to try and get over that hump of like feeling like there's something wrong or a failure when you're running, when you have an error message pop up or a bug you can't figure out, is to have everyone successfully write a hello world and then I challenge them to make it break. Um, because once you kind of get over that hump or build up your tolerance um, to finding a bug or finding an error, it feels a lot scary when it happens on accident. You know that you can work through it. Um, another thing that I love to do is to celebrate error messages, particularly if someone is working on a project or a problem and they keep running into to something that they're trying to work through, but when they get a new error message, that is excellent news. Right? I always like to cheer uh, and have them high five their neighbor because if you're getting a new error message, it means that you're working on something that is part of the problem. Sometimes you are making it worse, but <laughs> not everyone has to know that. And just the idea that making any type of progress or getting at the root of the problem is really where you want to start because eventually you'll get to the solution. Um, embedding personalization, this one is so huge and part of why I love processing and I'm excited for the rest of the day. So defining project function, not form. Uh, so if you're coming up with a project, whether it's for yourself or for others to try, leave some things really open-ended. Give them like a starting point, a couple of um, functions or parameters that they have to meet as well as an objective, but leave a lot of the middle space open for personalization and then imbuing their personality. One great way to do this is to encourage inventive themes and storytelling. So one of my suggestions that I have later in the presentation is making a maze game, right? We can all picture what a maze is, but the theme can be absolutely anything you want. So someone could make it be the color blue, or trees, or their favorite book, or anything that they care about at the moment, um, but you can, you can collapse or, or fold in all of those interests into that one project and still have everyone uh, follow the instructions of having two obstacles, a main character, and then an endpoint to the maze. 
And finally, essentializing community. So events like this, um, but particularly within one meetup or a classroom, think about pair programming. Um, so having everyone work together with a partner, sharing one computer. Um, there are also like coding uh, musical chairs so that people can get up and actually interact with the work that other people are doing while it's still in progress. Um, and then we always, at Girls Who Code, encourage our classrooms to do stand-ups so that everyone is away from their machines, standing in a circle and sharing something that they're really proud of, something that they're looking forward to in a place where they're needing help. It really ties back to the idea of being vulnerable in the space that you're in while you're working together. Um, but reminding everyone every single time that you meet that it is okay to ask for help and that they are there um, to support each other is, is a way to encourage that lifelong learning and constant seeking of help that is going to lead back to um, excitement and brand new projects. So I wanted to leave everyone with a couple of like really key takeaways for things that you can do. Again, I'm thinking of this as a professional educator, so envisioning after school programs or classrooms, but in any space where you are bringing someone into this community that you're a part of or interests that you really, really enjoy, think about how you can incorporate things like uh, journaling or building a story together, um, testing each other's uh, projects to provide help um, and really build community and then um, celebrating each other at every opportunity that you get. So if you'd like to follow me, I'm Chrissy Zip on everything except for live journal. Please don't find me there. Uh, <laughs> But I really, as I said a couple of times, I'm super excited about the rest of this day um, and appreciate you all taking a journey back with me through my old writing and blog post and intro computer science journey. So thank you. We have a lot of time for Q&A. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Yeah. Um, I'm curious because, uh, so a lot of the like platforms you talked about at the beginning, like live journal and stuff, uh, that kind of site where you have sort of like, basically like CSS code injection as a way of like styling it, and that's how a lot of people kind of like accidentally write out a code. Mm -hmm. That kind of doesn't really exist anymore, um, which is sort of a shame because it was a way of like tricking people almost into learning how to code. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of curious, is there anything right now that's kind of analogous to that, or do we just kind of have to be more intentional about getting people into coding like early on? Yeah, that's a really great question. I can't think of anything with that that has the ability to like, as part of the platform or an extension to build something in HTML or CSS, um, but I would love to hear if anyone else knows of something. Yeah. WordPress does it. WordPress still does it, yeah. Yeah. That's a great, yeah, and Scratch is very community-based um, since you do create a profile and save everything there. Um, if anyone uses Scratch, which I do a lot actually, um, there are some really cool, I think, affinity communities around that, and particularly they do a lot of, I, I think that they really follow some of the function over form, like they're animated, there's a whole community of people that just make animated music videos on Scratch, um, so if you haven't seen any of those, I highly recommend you go check them out. <laughs> Yeah. Have you looked into, in the beginning you started to mention some philosophy about patents. Have you ever looked into like social contract theory and how like you make social contracts every day with which websites you choose and which money you use, especially with the cars? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting thing to explore is the, the contracts that we do make. 
Um, and again, speaking from my experience primarily in classrooms, that is something that we explicitly build into all of our curriculum is on the first day, having everyone build the whole classroom together, build classroom norms around how they're gonna interact with each other and build things. So I think it's interesting to try and extrapolate that to like the internet as a larger classroom <laughs> um, in, my, in my particular context. Um, but I was even thinking that there are a lot of these features of you know, social sharing and commenting and other things in all the platforms that we use today. And what the, the, some of the differences, I think, is the ability to um, personalize your page in a way that like the, that like LiveJournal uh, used to let you because you're pretty limited for like how you can update your Facebook profile and make it look um, and have people interact with it because that's kind of determined by them. Yeah. Website Neopets. Mm -hmm. um, there's rumors, I think it's been confirmed that it was created by Scientologists. Uh, do you feel it's indoctrinated? It's a little bit of a problem. Do you feel it's like partially or attempted to indoctrinate people in sociology? I have no idea. I've actually never heard that before. <laughs> That's very interesting. <laughs> Right now, you know, screen edited because a mm -hmm. like from Instagram or something gives. 
gives, not like, oh, you're great, but the kid is failing. So it's like a true compliment is like how you get here and a fail right at the end. You know, like kind of a true compliment really gives that air. And, mm -hmm. and he was saying that like always try to keep it four to one, like four positive, one negative, so that they could really, you know, like move on. Because if you give one to one, it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. but if you give like four to one, you know, that really helps for the, you know, child to really feel good in that classroom. Yeah, I think that's a lot to, that like ties into this really well. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned a few times that I always think about is celebrating mistakes. Um, and there's a lot that you can do in those specific compliments. Like when someone has run into a mistake, there are still things they can do that are important problem solving skills for later on. So pointing out and praising the, the problem solving skills that they used um, can help them understand like what was good about the way they approached the problem, even if they're not seeing the result that they want yet. Um, so thinking about how you can, can draw attention to, to those skills and celebrate them every day. Yeah. Just curious about your thoughts on block-based versus text-based coding for Ooh. middle school students, mm -hmm. and maybe what's more appropriate, what's more effective, you know, things, things along those lines. Okay, so block-based versus text-based. I love block-based co co programming languages. Um, and I think that folks tend to want to move away from them really, really quickly because they feel like they're either not real coding, quote unquote, or that they're childish. Um, I hope no one here, I'd love to talk to you if you feel that way. Um, but I think that start that digging in a little bit if you feel that there are kids that are pulling away from it, like investigating like why they're feeling that way, because it can lead to a really interesting discussion on what like quote unquote real computer science is. Um, and even talking about, you can talk about abstraction and how the blocks are just like another level of an abstraction. Um, but I do think that it's important um, to have multiple, I, I think one thing that can be really valuable, I should say, is to have um, exposure to the same concepts in multiple languages. So if you're working with students or people that really, really want to move on to Python or a JavaScript or any other language that's more text-based, um, using both to sort of toggle back and forth so that they can see how a for loop works in one program and what it looks like in the other. And then a great challenge is to go back and rebuild projects that you've done in either language in the other. Um, so things like processing are really great because there's so much animation in a lot of block-based programming languages that once you learn how to animate in a text-based language, you can really kind of do a one-to-one -one matchup of things that they've built before. Yeah, I like that idea too, of picking a block base where you can toggle. Um, and with the community nature of Scratch, you can also show them really advanced projects. Um, because I think that's part of why I like the animated music videos and a lot of the video games that, that are out there, like shared with the community. Because once you sort of see what can be built with it, it doesn't seem as like, oh, you can just like draw a square or make your cats fit in a circle. Um, there's a lot, it's, it's still a really powerful language. Yeah. So you just wanted to say, you can go as long as you want. Okay. Um, our, our lunch is a little bit late to be set up. Okay. And so you can hang out, go as, as long as you want in this space. And cool. Lunch should be hopefully set up in about 10 to 15. Okay, perfect. I'll take a couple more and then we can meet each other up during lunch to keep talking about this. Yeah, what's up? Um, so I'm curious, uh, when I tried to kind of get my like, niece or nephew into programming a little bit, the problem I would run into is just that like, there's so much kind of upfront that I don't know, in my mind you need to know about programming before you be doing it cool, like what a variable is or like how it's the loops work. They tend to be, I think, kind of boring until you understand why you need them. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious how you get over that hump of like needing to know like syntax mm -hmm. or just concepts to programming before you can kind of do the cool thing that shows up on screen and looks really neat. That's a 
that's such an, that's such a common challenge. I feel like um, I mean starting with something really small I think is always really good. Um, so particularly, well, not even in block-based programming languages, um, but thinking of something that's pretty easy to accomplish even if you don't have some of the foundational um, like computer science concepts, um, but that can later be um, made more efficient that way. So I already mentioned drawing a square. I feel like that's like a great place to start no matter what language you're using, particularly if it's visual. Um, and so getting, and if it's something that's more text-based, um, thinking of like a certain game or like even just getting to print out your name can be something that's like really cool or like sending messages back and forth to like whoever you're, you're working with. Um, so doing something again that has sort of that benefits from that instant gratification but then also has a level of personalization. Because um, sometimes I've, I've realized the more that I've done Hello World setups with people, they don't, they, they think that the computer knows what the words hello, the string like hello world means. And so getting folks to, to even just change that text and print out their own thing or like a sentence that they invented um, can make them be like, oh, that's so cool. How could I get it to like say both of those things at the same time? Yeah. Um, I really appreciated your talk. Yeah, happy to share. Um, I think one anecdote that also reminds me of the, the girl with the blank screen um, has to do with sharing like projects and results also. Um, so, you know, I, th I think that one thing is like, if you call on the first person who raises their hand, it's usually someone who has like figured it out and is really confident that they know the right answer. So when you're sharing out, when you're like, if it's time to show works in progress or what you created in your project, to kind of be intentional about who is coming up to show something to the class, because if you take, you know, just the first student who's done all of the extensions and done the coolest version of the project, and it's like, because they've taken a class like that before, and they picked it up really quickly, um, the, you know, it's great to celebrate that, but the message that that might send to some of the other people in the classroom, if they're not at the same level, is like, I totally don't get it, and I don't know what's going on. Um, so one thing that you can be mindful of while people are working um, is to take a look at people who are at sort of different levels in the, the project or at different points of progress and ask them one-on-one -on -one if they would be willing to come up and share what they're in the middle of with the rest of the class um, so that you can kind of norm and give everyone a better sense of, you know, it's not just this one person who was super excited to share the thing that they know is 100% complete and awesome, um, but there are people kind of like that are struggling with the same things as you or have figured out something that you are still working on so that you can create that connection and level the expectation that like everyone's already done and you're the only one that's behind. Awesome, so I'm gonna um, let everyone go and get ready for lunch, but please come and find me the rest of the day. I'll be in and out of the workshops and the talks. Um, so thank you so much for digging into my old uh, blog with me. Thank you.